Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see a full house tonight. Welcome to our Board of Education meeting and our budget workshop. Um, please take a minute, take a look at your cell phones, make sure they're on vibrate or silent. After you've done that, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which I stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you have the roll call? Yeah. Okay. So I'll do roll call. President yeah. McFarland? Here. Vice President Roush is here. Secretary Hatfield will be here. Um, Treasurer Lauterbach is absent. Member Baker? Here. Member Blazy? Here. Member Ringgold? Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, the second item on our combined agenda tonight is request to address the board. This is for the budget workshop only. Are there any requests to address the board for the budget workshop? There will be another opportunity to address the board. It's just going to be a little bit later in the meeting. Okay. We're going to move past that. Um, next up, we have item three, board discussion and prioritization for 23-24 general fund budget. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, President Farley. Appreciate that. Sir. Hey, John. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to be able to facilitate this once again for you. Um, as we, before we get into the details, just a reminder for you all what the intent of this budget workshop is. The intention of the next 25 minutes is for me to give you a history of where Mid Midland Public has been financially. Um, we focus really on the last 10 to 15 years, so you can get a picture of where we've been and where we are currently. It's also to give you our very first insights into what we think next year's revenues and expenditures may look like. Um, by this time in April, we only have certain amount of information from our legislature on what we think revenues are going to look like, and we are right in the middle of predicting what our expenditures are as well, too. So we'll give you a bit of a window into what our predictions are for next year, um, and we will also have opportunities for you all to weigh in um, at certain points on certain budget priority areas. So we are at April 17th, the budget workshop. We don't have any official budget actions in May, but in June, uh, we have two. The first meeting in June is where I present to you our first draft of the 23-24 budget. Um, we don't act on it at that time. It's just simply me presenting it to you. It also includes our millage rates, and that's our truth and taxation hearing. And then on the 19th, we have two action items. That's the official adoption of the 23-24 budget, um, and it's also the second and final amendment of the 22-23 budget. So that's where we are in our current timelines. Um, we always start with a look at where we stand today. And um, it is very, very good for us to be able to report to you that Midland Public is in a very strong financial position. Um, we have been very fortunate over the past seven years to be able to add to our fund balance. And currently, we are in a spot where we have just over 33% general fund balance. And when we're talking about fund balance, it's simply a division problem. It's us taking the total amount of money that we have in reserves in the bank, and we divide that by our total number of expenditures for the year, and it gives you a percentage. Um, percentages can be sometimes a dangerous game, and they can be a dangerous game sometimes because your percentage may change even though your net financial position has not. Um, just a case in point for you, we have in the bank right now in our reserves just over $30 million. Um, last year, our final expenditures came in around $90 million. We could have the exact same fund balance, not have any change in that at all. And this year, our predicted expenditures at this point are about $114 million. If you do that new division problem, your percentage will have dropped, but that doesn't mean that your financial position has changed drastically as well, too. So percentages can be a bit dangerous, but by all terms, your auditors will tell this to you and all school finance will tell you that being above 30% is a very strong financial position. Another thing that the board has been but fabulous stewards of is also siloing certain dollars within our fund balance and we have what we call assigned fund balance and in our assigned fund balance we've been saving for years and years to replace our copiers 
We've been putting money aside every single year for technology replacement when that time comes. We've also been siloing dollars away for bus replacements um, when our bond proceeds are gone as well too. So we've been taking dollars and saving those for certain specific areas and we do break that out into total fund balance and unassigned fund balance. So right now you're in a very healthy position as a Board of Education and have been good stewards for future um, budget adoptions should the need come to be able to rely on some of those reserves. This just puts it into a perspective for you on where we have been in our general fund balance. We like to show this going back into the 90s because times are not always as they are right now. You can see that the budget is largely cyclical. What goes up must come down and what goes down must come up, right? And as I pointed out, we've been very fortunate the past seven years to be able to build ourselves into the position that we are. This is where a bit of a, a history lesson needs to start in all of this. Um, two years ago, when our fund balance started getting into that 25% range, we really made a concerted effort to start leveling off, and we did not intend to put away as much money as we did. Unfortunately, the pandemic came. Um, the one if you want to say a positive outcome, which there weren't many out of that, um, the pandemic made it cheaper to operate a school district. Um, when you're not running buses for a period of time, I'm not paying for the fuel. Um, your buildings, your HVAC isn't running as much as well too. And there were savings that came along with that. And if you look at that graph and you look between the 20 and 21 school year, you'll see that we jumped after plateauing. And that jump that year really was largely due to the pandemic savings. And you can see that last fiscal year, we started leveling off again. And in my last budget amendment presentation, we expect to be in that leveling phase again, where we're gonna be right about balanced and maybe even a little bit under on that as well this year, which is not a bad thing. It's getting ourselves back into budget alignment where we're not putting three, four, and $5 million away every single year and just siloing it. We're putting those dollars where they need to go. I told you before that we also have an unassigned fund balance. This graph just illustrates uh, the point that I was making before about expenditures and percentages. Even though our dollar amount has continued to grow, because our expenditures have continued to grow, you now can see that our percentage is starting to drop just a touch on that unassigned fund balance, even though our whole dollar amount um, is continuing to grow in that silo. A couple of things that your um, board has done for us to put us in this healthy financial position is to design our raise thresholds for all of our employee groups with the exception of one um, around what our percentage of unassigned fund balance is. The better the district does financially, the larger the raise the employee groups get. Um, so it really is a protection for the board that we are not locked into raises if financial times um, go in a different direction, but it also rewards employees if the district continues to do very well financially as well too. So we've structured that into a majority of our bargaining agreements that we have. There's a lot of numbers here, and please don't get lost into them. What I really want you to focus on are the greens and the pinks. I showed this here. This was a, a Bob Cooper chart that he had put together, and I'll continue to show it as well because it shows that times are not always perfect, right? Um, when you see the pinks, that was years that we um, adopted and then ended um, in the negatives those years. And you could see that the greens are really showing your past seven years where we have finished to the positive, but sometimes we adopt a negative budget, project it, and finish in the positives as well too. So this shows that we've had a very successful run the past seven years, but it also shows that it's abnormal to have a run that is that successful for that long. So we do expect times to stabilize themselves very quickly here. I do wanna talk about those past seven years and why they've been um, successful for Midland Public from a financial standpoint. Um, really, one thing that Mike tries to simplify when it comes to school finances, and he's right on this, it's about the number of students that you have. It's about dollars per student, and it's about your enrollment and stability. Um, during our rough financial times from 08, 09 to 14, 15, the district was averaging a loss of over 200 students per year. When you're losing over 200 students per year, it's rough to be able to balance your budgets because you're automatically dealing with uh, revenue declines. But from 15, 16 to 22, 23, that's reversed itself. And now we're averaging only a loss of about 30 students per year, which largely matches up with the birth rates that we're seeing within our demographic studies. So when you switch from losing 200 to 30, that helps your net position. Um, what do we attribute that to? Well, our enrollment specialist 
tell us that we shouldn't be doing that well. We've beat their projections the past seven years, and we attribute that to adding strategic programming. Young Fives programs, preschool programs, STEM programs, retaining students at our upper levels that are struggling with our PATHS program as well too. Our facilities improvements to be able to attract and retain families. And we also do need to note that during the pandemic, that bump year that I showed you in there, um, there was a formula that helped us out with our enrollment count in that fiscal year because they knew that there was a large amount of the population that chose not to attend school that year. So enrollment stability has been key for MPS to be in the position that we are today. You could see our enrollment trend. You can see the downward spiral of the roller coaster that it was for over a decade. And you could see where the stabilization point came in, which led to our financial recovery. You could see our COVID hit that almost every single school district in the state of Michigan took, but then you could see our stabilization trend um, come right back. And again, we are continuing to beat what our projected counts are from our demographic specialist. State funding is the next piece of that. It's the number of students you have, and it's the dollars per student that the state is allocating to you. During our period of enrollment decline, we were also averaging a loss of $113 year over year per student. That means that the state was giving us on average $113 less each year, um, and that's not adjusted for inflation. So you were taking even bigger hits during those years. And then from 1415 to 2223, that has now almost reversed itself identically, and we're averaging about $111 per student increase per year. You'll see when we get to our projected revenue section that the governor is proposing a $458 per student increase this year, which comes out to about 5%. Um, those don't happen all the time. Um, and those are increases that, are, that allow us to be able to grow into what our year-over-year -year expenditures are. We also have to acknowledge the bond. Um, our generous citizenry did vote in 2015 to authorize um, those capital improvements and that allowed us to take dollars and put them into the classroom rather than having to put them onto capital expenditures. That also helped us bolster our general fund as well. We have to acknowledge our employees during some of the harder times. Um, there were contractual sacrifices. Um, from 10-11 to 16-17, it was either a 0% increase or concessionary compensation during those times. So our employees did make those sacrifices to help MPS get back on footing. Um, we are proud to announce that since 1718 and every year since, we've been able to restore many of those wage scales to where they were previously and add. Since 1819, the district's been able to increase our hourly wages by an average of 24%, and our salary wages is around 13%. So we've been able to reward our employees as the district has become more fiscally solvent and stable. There were also miscellaneous decisions that happened along the way. Um, central office was restructured. Our curriculum department was restructured from subject area specific people to um, level specific people. There was a teacher retirement incentive that was put into play. We call it a buyout um, that took a lot of our higher end teachers and replaced them with teachers that are on the lower end of the pay scale. The savings from that are temporary short term and you should only do those things when you really technically need to do them to remain solvent because it's only short term savings and creates bubbles in the future. Um, grant procurement has been something that you hear from us all the time and we've been able to aggressively go after grants to be able to help support our programs and then also our strategic use of our annual funding. You hear me say the word variance a lot and variance is very important to us in our budget right now with $114 million in expenditures predicted 1% is a swing of $1.14 million either way. So if we can bring in a 1% or 2% variance, that's a pretty significant financial um, addition for us at our year-end closure. We do have to talk about um, our federal and state supplementary funds for COVID. Um, this is going to be something that's going to become a topic more and more as next year comes. Throughout all state and federal sor sources related to COVID-19, there was about 13.3 million extra dollars that came into the district. Note that all of those need to be spent um, by the end of the 23-24 school year. So come next year, the end of that fiscal year is when we plan to have all of those dollars spent. And so those sources were one time um, and will not continue past the expiration of it. Um, so that also helped us during the past couple of years um, to be able to support 
um, enhanced programming for our students. One thing that will be coming out soon in the press is um, reports on how school districts have spent their COVID dollars. We've told this to you before when Penny and I talked, we've used our COVID dollars for what we believe they were intended for, which is providing enhanced academic um, supports and social emotional supports for our students. So those dollars have created enhanced programming and that's something that we're gonna have to continuously analyze to see what dollars are left to be able to support what we know has proven to be effective out of those strategies. So that is where we are to date. And I always will present to you a statistical analysis, analysis that the state does. It's called State Bulletin 1014. It's a very colorful graph, um, but I'll just give it to you in brief on how to read it. When you're looking at the numbers that are highlighted, the ones that are in yellow, those are the most current fiscal years. So that's reporting on how we spent our money last year. It compares Midland Public Schools to every single other school district in the state of Michigan in terms of how we are spending our dollars in the amount of dollars that we receive per student. The first number that you want to pay attention to is the number 822. That's the current number of school districts in the state of Michigan. And so when you're looking at the rank and they're putting the rank down there, that's where Midland Public falls within that ranking system. There is one data piece of note. This is general fund revenue per pupil, the amount of dollars that we're getting per student and where Midland Public ranks. I want you to focus on the total sources and I want to point out to you something that actually is pretty impactful. If you look four years back, we were in the top third in the state of Michigan in general fund revenue dollars per pupil. If you look now, we've now fallen into the bottom third of the state. It's a pretty drastic swing. And there's two reasons for this. Reason number one is not this, but last year, the governor equalized funding across the state. Large sums of money went to raise the minimum foundation almost up to equal to where Midland Public is. So when all of that equal out, Midland Public went to the middle of the pack. The other piece that's really impacting this is the amount of federal dollars that have gone into districts that were allocated per the Title I formula. Higher poverty districts got higher amounts of money. And I've given you statistics before on this. Um, Flint School District has half of our population received $99 million in federal sources for COVID. Midland Public, as I just showed you, was around 13 million. So you're seeing those shift, right? And that's what's impacting Midland Public going from the top third to the bottom third. What we anticipate is over time, you're gonna see it level out and we expect to be right around the middle of that bell curve in the 50th percentile. Um, that's what we expect to happen over the next couple of years. But the legend that Midland Public is funded higher than the average bear, that's really starting to shift and it's gone quite quickly over the past couple of years. In terms of expenditures, um, this now shows you what you're spending your dollars on within the same ranking system. The one that's impactful here for us to be able to talk about is instructional salaries and benefits. And you can see that Midland Public is falling in at a rank of 239 out of 822, putting us in the top tier of the state in dollars that we are spending on our instructional salaries and our instructional benefits as well too. In terms of expenditures per pupil, this is a slide that I do like to focus on every single year because this shows that your dollars are not being spent on excess operations, maintenance, business, and administration costs. Out of 822 districts in the state, for business and administration, we come in at 779th, and operations and maintenance, we come in at 762nd. Um, that shows that we are being very efficient in how we're running those different departments. I will point out, if I have a crystal ball and I make a prediction, you're gonna see business and administration swing on you a little bit, and that's gonna be largely due to the amount of social emotional learning managers that we hired this year to be able to train and support our teachers in that area. So we've added five or six managers that are temporary COVID funding, so you might see that move a little bit, but we expect to still be in that 700 range after that bubble goes through. This one, um, it's a shame John's not here right now, um, but I'll make, I'm sure that he's gonna take a look at this. He always asks this question about where we fall in teacher salaries. This has come up a couple of times. We've never presented this data point before, but I did pull it from the bulletin this year. 
This is our ranking for our average teacher salaries that come out of the same bulletin. You can see that Midland Public out of 822 districts come in, comes in at a rank of 60, putting us in the 90th percentile with an average salary right now of just over $70,000. So that shows that we are in the top tier in the state in terms of our average teacher compensation as well too. Phil, this is a slide for you. Um, at the last board meeting um, with the budget amendment, you said we talked a lot about numbers, but not about specifically where those dollars are going. Um, so we grabbed this and put this graph in here for you. This shows um, where we are as a district in terms of how we are by function or general area spending our 114, 595,149 predicted dollars this year. When you look at that chart, it all really is anchored over three quarters or 77.1% is directly to classroom and student supports. You could see that there's a lot of smaller sub areas which directly aligns with the data that you've seen as well too. So over three quarters of our budget is classroom instruction, student supports, and instructional supports. And you can see how the other areas break out in terms of transportation, athletics, maintenance, support services, et cetera, et cetera. So that shows you where the prioritization and a majority of those funds are. Out of that, you could break it down further and further, but we've only got a half hour, so I'm not gonna go that deep for you. But within that 114 million, 85% of that is all salaries and benefits. We talk a lot about the other things and they get a lot of attention, but when it comes to the true impact in your budget, it's the number of people that you employ and the salaries and benefits um, that those people receive. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here either because this was the focus of our last presentation. This is what our current general fund snapshot is. I simply show it to you again um, because we are predicting this year that we are gonna be much closer to balanced um, than we have been in the past. We do not anticipate extremely large sums of dollars being deposited back into the general fund this year. We expect that it's gonna largely be much more stable than it was before. We now shift to what we are anticipating for revenues for next year. We look at three factors. We take a look at how many students we're predicting there's gonna be. We look at our predictions on what the state is gonna allocate us per student, as well as categorical grants that go along with those. We also then take a look at our expenditures. As I just said, 85% of those expenditures are tied up in personnel. So we have to do very deep analysis on compensation, benefits, retirement, and our staffing levels. I do wanna tell you though, um, there has been a dynamic that's been occurring with our hiring that has flipped um, typical savings year over year when it comes to personnel. In a typical year, if you were to have 30 teacher retirements, there are savings that would come in for higher end teachers being replaced by younger end teachers. For those that are on the HR subcommittee, we've shared this statistic with you. Last year, when we hired, two thirds of our hires came with experience from other districts and only one third were straight out of college. That trend is largely mirroring again this year. So some of those savings that you were getting year over year are not as great as they were before because our personnel hiring is from acquiring people that have experience from other districts. It's great because they have that experience, but when it comes to the salaries and benefits, that's something that we have to make up for in other spots of the budget as well too. So we expect that to continue um, for at least the next couple of years. The other 15%, as I said before, does get a lot of attention, but really isn't the huge bulk part of our budget. Penny's gonna talk tonight a lot about textbooks and curriculum adoptions. It's a very large section of the agenda. Um, these are the, what we call other 15% of the agenda. We've spent a lot of time internally. Our business team has met with every single building. They've met with every single department to build their budgets from zero on their needs for next fiscal year. We then take that, put it into the entire pie and we figure out what we can afford. Certain years, there are certain amount of dollars that are allocated to either furniture or technology or curriculum that they need. Um, it could be a year where weight rooms need bolstered a bit as well too. So we make those decisions um, when it comes to the final revenues and expenditures based on what identified needs are, what we predict our revenues are gonna be. For the state budget, um, I don't want you to burn this into your brain and memorize it because it will change. Um, typically this time of year, I would love to be able to show you this chart filled out where I have an executive, a Senate, and a House. We simply have an executive budget right now to be able to share with you. 
The executive budget, um, as I pointed out before, is proposing a $458 per student increase. We'll take it. Um, why that specific number? Because that's 5% increase. That's where they, they came up with that number from. We do also anticipate that some of the categorical areas that we receive this year are going to continue. We believe that the school safety funding is going to continue to the tune of about eight or $900,000. We believe that a pot of money called 31AA intended for mental health services of about the same amount, eight hundred to $900,000 is going to continue as well too. And there's some other interesting components of the budget we're not sure are going to go through. Universal free breakfast, universal free lunch are proposed in the budget. We're not sure if it's going to pass, but we hope that it does. Um, another thing that we anticipate maintaining is our current level of 31A at-risk funding. Thank you again to the board members and superintendent that lobbied for that. Um, that has brought us up to an at-risk allocation of almost $3 million, whereas before we were right around three quarters of a million dollars. So that's very impactful and will help us continue some of these ESSER programs into the future. We're anticipating that that will stay the same as well too. The state has um, increased our special education reimbursements over the past couple of years, which has been very helpful to us as well. This year we're being funded at 75% of the foundation allowance. It's proposed by the governor to go up to 87.5%, and we hope that that goes through as well. So the governor's budget is favorable. We'll see what comes from the House. We'll see what comes from the Senate. As we get closer to that June adoption, we're going to have to take our best educated guess. And when we are guessing for you, we usually do it from a conservative lens. So we're not painting an unrealistic picture for you. And we try to come out better than we anticipated um, when we do our budget proposals for you. So now we shift into our predictions and what it could look like. So playing the pessimistic role a touch, the governor says $458 a student. Let's be a touch pessimistic and say that when the House and Senate are done, it comes out at $400 per student. If we come in at $400 a student above where we are this year, and we build an enrollment decline of 50 students in, um, which is what it's sort of looking like right now with our initial estimates, in the end, that means about a $3 million increase in revenues year over year from where we are right now. When you look at our expenditures, and we are running our very first predictive models on this, we are building in salary increases at our labor groups at 2.75%. Employees also step as well too, meaning that as they gain experience, they move up on their salary scales. Teachers also change categories. Categories means that they are acquiring higher degrees. More college credits would also move them on the scale as well too. And we take a prediction at medical costs increase. We've built our first medical prediction at 8%. It says four, I know that, but that's because we only pay half of that increase in a fiscal year because of the way that the term of that provides. So that's an 8% predict, eight prediction with the 4% impact on our budget. And then department budget requests, that's from us meeting with the buildings, meeting with all of the individual departments and what they believe their year over year cost increases will be based on what their needs are. When you put all that into our fancy formulas, you hit enter. If all of that remains 100% true, that means for our expenditures to be offset by revenues, we would need a foundation increase of just around $520 to make that happen. So we're not hugely out of the ballpark. Again, I built it a touch pessimist, pessimistic, but when you're hearing $458 um, per student and saying, wow, that's a whole bunch of money, Really, it's a 5% increase, and that 5% increase when you're giving compensation increases, CPI is going up, costs are going up as well too. Um, it's almost causing us to break even year over year on what our revenues and expenditures are. So there's other variables that we need to chat about here real quick. I just messed that up, Sarah. There we go, thank you, got it back. Um, Student enrollment numbers, we're going to keep taking a look at those. We will revise that. Mr. Shero looks at those and gives us weekly reports on what our sections are and our line staffing. We'll continue to watch what's coming out of the House, what's coming out of the Senate, and see how that balances with what the, the governor is going to say. Our medical costs are always a guess because we don't get those until later in the year, and we're going to keep taking an eye at our variants. But I also do want to note and reemphasize again as well, too, that when our ESSER funds do expire, you are going to see a drop in our overall revenues and expenditures. 
not in next year's budget, but in the budget year after, both are going to go down and we're going to have to start having some of those conversations about what programming can be sustained. Conversation to be having around next winter when we're starting to get into our budget um, for the following year after that. A recap for you on our key budget dates, our 23-24 budget um, will be presented to you on June the 5th. We're going to work hard to try and make that as accurate as possible for you and we'll take our best guess at what we're going to get from the legislature. At the June 19th meeting, you will have budget amendment number two coming at you and we will also ask you to officially adopt our 23-24 budget. So with that said, um, that is our workshop and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have and listen to any feedback that you have as we work diligently to bring you a budget at that first June Board of Education meeting. Any questions, comments from the board? Could yeah. you go back to, sorry. You wanna go first? Could you go back to the predicted revenues? We only saw that for a quick second. The overall revenue for incoming funds for next year is going to be just shy of three million is our initial projection okay but our total because our total expenditures is 114 million yes sir how much money are we going to take in total for the whole district we're going this to this year yep we're projected to be around 111 but that's all going to be dependent on variance okay at the end of the year you will see likely a drop in expenditures 114 is not going to come in at 114 and our revenues may tweak a little bit as well too based on how much ESSER money that we draw in this fiscal year so those are gonna to continue to move on you and um, are always in flux, which is why we have to take a look at our audit to be able to give you those real projections. Every single year, Brad, when I propose to you in June, that first budget meeting, my fund balance number changes between that first meeting mm -hmm. and that second meeting based on the shifts that I'm making at that budget amendment. It's always a moving target. Um, so those numbers will continue to vary by a couple of percent and each percent that we vary is in the million dollar range now so they're going to continue to shift on you so our covid money that we were talking about rounding it up is 14 million 13 something yes sir okay now we're going to have to set i you talk about next winter starting to talk about that but i think that i think that because it's a significant amount of money i think we could start talking about a little bit earlier than that to figure sure. out what we really want to keep because of what's working and i think that we ought to start that maybe in the summer or the fall for clarification penny's team's already working on it okay. and i don't want to speak for you penny um tell, tell me when i'm wrong um but they do have is it monthly meetings with your principals with our principals that do data analysis on those um and so they are continuously collecting data on the effectiveness of those interventions that we've put into play a lot, Brad, too, on what can be sustained is going to depend on categorical dollars as well that the state continues to provide for us. In terms of the mental health supports, I try to stay out of the acronym world because Mike will give me a dirty look and say, don't say those things, but 31 AA money, 31 N6 money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mental health support dollars, we believe are going to support a large amount of the mental health initiatives that we currently have in. And we have intentionally left a touch of room in our current 31A budget to be able to absorb what Penny's team, our administrators, our stakeholders believe is working as well too. So um, in terms of working on it, they already are. In terms of final decision making, that's probably a more accurate depiction of what next winter will be so that we can make those final decisions based on what Penny's team yeah, has Yeah, so at discovered. least the next year, you meant after July 1. So you are on the same page, mm -hmm. what you're saying. And there's room in the budget to not only um, pick up some of those dollars of the programs that come out effective, but also most of its personnel. And so, for example, this year, when we we're done, we'll have hired 40 new personnel. Plenty of room to do that through attrition going back in as well. And also a reminder too, Brad, that not all 13 million shows up in this year's budget. Mm -hmm. It's been spread over three years, yep. ESSER one, ESSER two, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, it's been smooth and we have it budgeted for next year as well to reserve dollars to sustain the current programming that we have in. That was my question, Brian, was the, of that 14, like how much is already gone, how much is in this numbers and how much is, is buffering next year? So we, it's, <laughs> It's, it's tough to give you that exact answer right now because it changes on us um, yeah. daily. 
um, based on personnel coming in, et cetera. But roughly this year built into our budget in ESSER dollars, we're about three and a half million. Um, and we have roughly the same for next year as well too to be able to support. Um, we've built that budget intentionally to be able to sustain us when we built the initial plan. But that plan that Penny and I presented <coughs> to you, know that that's changed multiple times because we've shifted dollars around as the state has given us more categorical money. We were paying for all of our student support specialists out of ESSER dollars until the mental health money came in. And then we shifted. And when we shifted, it allowed us to do some of those additional items that the board um, approved, the universal breakfast, those type of things as well too. So we've shifted those dollars around to maximize their usage and to also give us the most longevity that we can out of the funds. And a reminder when we do all of that, that goes through a consolidated application that Penny constantly upstates that it gets approved by MDE. You met Kim Funnel a couple of meetings back, mm -hmm. and Kim is the mastermind behind the scenes on getting all of those applications approved for us and helping us with the red tape and the paperwork that goes along with that. I was just, I actually had the same question as Brad, so rather than bore you with asking the same question again, I would just say, when I think of the presentation that Penny's given in the past that had that was on your very last slide, basically it was the summary, top 5% district in the state on all of these different categories. We have really good student achievement and maybe stalled on growth. So it'd be really helpful as we move forward to see which of the COVID programs, data-driven, we need to keep. So. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank appreciate you, it. Brother. Appreciate Thank it. You. Well done. Okay. Before we move on to item number four, just to let uh, everybody know who's standing in back, there are six open seats up front. If anybody wants a front row seat tonight, uh, <laughs> you're welcome to take it. That said, we'll move on. We're at item uh, four, our consent agenda of what would typically be our regular meeting. Um, item 4.1 is approval of the minutes from March 20, 2023 regular meeting. Item 4.2 on the agenda is a list of staff being recommended for hire. Item 4.3 is a list of staff who have announced their resignation along with the effective dates. Item 4.4 is a food service renewal. The administration is recommending the renewal of the food service contract with Chartwells for the 23-24 school year. This is the fourth renewal out of the five-year contract. Item 4.5 is approval of the payments, uh, approval of the payment of the school's bills for the month of February in the amount of $7,358,839. And item 4.6 is a list of legal payments uh, to Truon Law Firm and Taft, Stettinus, and Hollister LLP. The amounts there um, are listed. And that's it for the consent agenda. I'll accept the motion. Motion to approve consent agenda items number 4.1 through 4.6. Second. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Ms. Ringgold. Any discussion regarding items 4.1 through 4.6? Um, we have two new hires in there and the director of early childhood services is that the one that we were talking about or is that a different position that we're still waiting that your um, Pam's replacement it is the director of that is Services. okay all right and that is a, a hire from within the district correct okay was that your question Brad yes okay thanks okay all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The consent agenda passes. Next up, we have item five, uh, 5.1, our shining stars. Mike. If Nancy's here, would you come up and join me, Nancy? I don't yes. know if I picked you out back in the crowd. So thank you, come on up here. You get to stand here very awkwardly with me for a few minutes while we read good things about you, okay? <laughs> Uh, Nancy MPS journey began in 2004 when she was hired to teach Spanish at Parkdale Elementary. 
from there she went to teach both Spanish and math at Midland High School and then went to Jefferson Middle School to teach math. She remains in this position currently. Nancy earned her Master of Arts degree in Education from Wake Forest University and con continued on to earn her Master's through classes taken at SVSU and CMU. Nancy was nominated for a shining star by an MPS parent and colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Our son is new to MPS this year and trying to adjust. He misplaced his binder at some point during the day, and Miss Barner took him around to see his other classes to help him locate it. <laughs> now you remember, huh? He, he was so appreciative of how kind she was in helping him. Thank you for making our new student feel welcome. Ms. Barner is passionate about teaching math. She's constantly building relationships with students in which she helps her connect math to everyday lives. She often gives up her own lunch periods to help students in her classroom. She goes above and beyond to help Jefferson students and has constant positive energy in, her, in our building. Congratulations, Nancy, for being our April Shining Star. Thank you. 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 And our second shiny star is Rory Rickert. She's not here tonight. Okay, Rory's not here. So but let's read all kinds of nice stuff about Rory. So, <laughs> Rory joined the MPS team in 2019 as a paraprofessional at Seabird Elementary, a position that she currently holds in addition to also being certified as a guest teacher, which was frequently does as well. Rory earned her bachelor's degree with a major in human development from Connecticut College and also holds a teaching certificate in all subjects grades K through five. Roy was nominated for a shining star by MPS colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Not only does Roy work above and beyond her role as a professional at Seabirt, she also tutors students before school hours as well as substitute teachers at a moment's notice. Roy is always looking for ways to make Seabirt a better place, including running a math extension program and working with Battle of the Books teams. While she has high standards for the students she works with, she always finds a way to help them reach their goals and works with all students, whether they are at lower skills or high achieving. Siebert would not be the same without her. Congratulations, Rory. All right, thanks, Mike. That brings us to item six on our agenda tonight, request to address the board. I have a list of people waiting to address the board. And for those of you who came in late that wish to address the board, I will give you that opportunity. Um, but for now, we're gonna start with Joe Bonides. Good evening, welcome. Hello. Uh, greetings. I'm here mostly to put a few things on the public record to eliminate future claims of being unaware. Based on talks I've given over the last 18 months, I hold no illusion that action will occur until it becomes awkward. So from the land of inconvenient information, there was a highly regarded report called the Corrigan Report, which is now considered the definitive statement that masking makes no difference in the fight against COVID-19 and its variants. Even the New York Times, not a bastion of conservatism, has acknowledged that. Don't go down the road again and muzzle the kids. Let's take steps to prevent the need for more SEL counselors. Number two, there were some comments from the superintendent about his entitlement to his personal information, i.e. his retirement date, after my comments during the February meeting. Yes, granted, no problem. For the record, I never asked him to tell me his retirement date. I gave scenarios if it were this summer or next summer. He's made more recent comments that it sounds like it's soon, missing Barton Mallow issues and vetting. For the record, if it is this summer, a search on the internet does not find a job search posting has been made by MPS for a new superintendent. The recent Meridian job was easy to find as are 13 current MPS teaching positions. So if the superintendent is retiring this summer, I go back to Mr. Lauterbach's comments at the League of Women Voters debate. The board has one employee. The citizens would like to know that you have done a proper search and found the best candidate for the job. Number three, my wife and I have been very amazed at some of the stellar programs that have been presented to the board most recently robotics and the ALPS program for the Elite 100. What we have not heard much about is what is being done to elevate the school population in the disadvantaged category where you get the 3,031,000 A, A, et cetera, funding. Can we hear some goals about breaking the cycle for these kids instead of how much money we get for them? And number four, lastly, the 
March meeting was very lively. Apparently, you have discovered the perils of not worshiping at the DEI altar with sufficient vigor. The Midland Daily News did not use the same level of colorful adjectives to describe the rowdiness of that group versus the domestic terrorists of 2021, and you forgot to have the armed security guards at the ready as you did for the anti-maskers in 2021. You also forgot to turn off their mics after three minutes, as you did for us. History may not be kind to this, pe in, to this period of history for a variety of reasons, and probably the only one we will all agree on in 10 years is the damage we've lockdowns and masking have done to the kids in this era. Thank you. Deb Plaver, did I say that right, Deb? Plaver. Plaver, I'm sorry. That's close, very close. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Reading is incredibly important. It is a fundamental, fundamental and essential skill. I think we'd all agree on that. I have come here tonight to express my disappointment that Michigan has revised the third grade reading law with Senate Bill 12, which strikes from law a requirement to hold back third graders who fail a reading proficiency exam. This bill was, was voted on and passed Friday, May tw Friday, March 24th, the first day of Michigan's spring break, and so many may have missed this. One teacher called Michigan's reading law, quote, state mandated mass flunking of third grade students based on one reading test score, unquote. While I do not want to see any students held back, I would argue that a standardized reading test is still an important and relative measure of a student's reading proficiency. An individualized plan is to be crafted, yet some students who have fallen behind do not have the home structure and or parental time available to implement a plan, nor in today's economy the resources to hire reading coaches. As a result, it is easy to see a widening gap between students going forward with those who cannot read at grade level in third grade struggling and most likely unable to keep pace at the higher grade levels. This suggests that students from households with lower parent involvement or students who are initially slower learners or from lower income families will fall further behind and be less likely to receive a good education and graduate. Moving forward, how is MBS going to ensure that all students have acceptable reading proficiency at the end of third grade? How will the reading proficiency be measured and how will MPS work with those students that do not have acceptable reading skills at the end of third grade? So I'm just leaving questions and 31A money may be the answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Buffy Hall. Good evening, Buffy, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Midland Public Schools leaders. My name is Buffy Hall. I was born and raised in Midland. As a youth, I swam for the Midland Dolphin swim team, the Jefferson Intermediate School swim team, and the Dow High Girls swim team. I have been teaching in the district for over 25 years, and I currently teach art at Woodcrest Elementary School. I have been a Midland Public Schools swim coach for over 20 years. I have coached the Northeast Co-Ed Swim Team and the Midland High Girls Swim Team. I currently coach the Jefferson Girls and Boys Swim Team, and I am the head coach of the Midland Dolphins. As you can see, my passion for teaching. I am an art teacher by day and a swim teacher by night. Tonight you will hear from a diverse representation of the Midland swimming community. Our aim is to inform all of you the importance of swimming in our community and what it means to all of us. Swimming in Midland has an impressive history. This fall, we have had over 80 high school girls and 60 middle school boys competing for their schools. This winter, we had 40 high school boys and 100 middle school girls competing. This school year, we have had over 200 swimmers participate on the Midland Dolphin swim team. As you can imagine, these numbers can be challenging with 10 lanes in our district, making it necessary for the coaches to be creative with their practices as not to overcrowd our pools. The Midland Dolphins is a foundation of Midland swimming. The focus of our young dolphins is to teach them basic swimming fundamentals. 
This is a place where kids learn to put their faces in the water, where they learn the four competitive racing strokes, where they learn to budget their time between sports and school, where they make friends for life, and where they learn that they can set goals and do hard things to achieve them. Over the years, I have coached thousands of swimmers from Midland Public Schools and the Tri-Cities. I have coached kids of all ages and abilities, state champions, and kids with special needs. I pour my heart and soul into these kids. My hope is that they find the same passion for swimming that Midland Public Schools and the Midland Dolphins has provided for me. If you listen to their stories, you will see why swimming is important to us and why we are asking for a partnership to help our kids and our swim program grow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Cal Rishi. Hi, Cal. Thanks for coming tonight. Hi. Hi, my name is Cal Reich. I am a third grader at Woodcrest Elementary. I have been swimming for the Midland Dolphins since I was four years old. This year I made seven state qualifying times. I currently hold three Dolphin records. As long as I've been a part of the Dolphins, they taught me how to be a better person and more social. When I grow up, I want to be in the Olympics and a surgeon. They taught me that I can do hard things. Please help me see my dreams by having the facilities I need. Thank you coaches for training me. Andre Freer. Is, did I pronounce your name correctly? Audrey. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have a hard time reading and writing. Hi, I'm Audrey Freer. I'm 10 years old and I'm in fourth grade at Seabrook Elementary. I've been swimming with the Midland Dolphins since I was six years old. This year I qualified for the state championship meet in seven different events. Um, at the meet, I placed six in my 100 IM, fifth in my 100 butterfly, and sixth in my 50 butterfly. I worked really hard during my training, and it felt amazing to see my hard work pay off. While I've been swimming with the Midland Dolphins, I've learned a lot about listening, setting goals, and supporting my teammates. My future goals for swimming are to see new set m new Midland Dolphins team records, new Dow High School team records, and to get a scholarship to swim at college. Right now, our swim group practices at Northeast Middle School. I'm thankful for the space to practice, but we are not able to use the starting blocks because they're falling apart and too slippery. We can only practice starts off the block when we are able to get time at Dow High, and that is not very often during our competitive swim season. A good start off the block can take seconds off your time, and I would just really like the opportunity to work on them more. I would love for the Northeast pool to stay open and to have new starting blocks so I can continue getting better. Thank you for supporting Mid the Midland Dolphins and our coaches. I hope that we can have your continued support to so I can reach my goals. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Ella Roberson. Hi, Ella. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. My name is Ella Roberson, and I'm a senior at Dow High School. I was born in Midland and moved to China when I was only 10 months old. My family would come to visit Midland during our summer break, and it was then that I learned to swim at Plymouth Pool. In order to join the swim team back in China, I had to swim one length of a 50-meter or Olympic-sized pool, which is a fairly long way for a six-year-old. But I was determined to be a swimmer, and at the age of six, I successfully joined my first swim team. I moved back to Midland when I was seven years old and started my Midland swimming career in the Jefferson Middle School pool. I've been swimming with the Midland Dolphins for nearly 10 years. I've swam on the Jefferson swim team, the Dow High swim team, and this fall I'll be swimming at the collegiate level at, for MIT. I'm thankful that Midland Public Schools has been able to maintain our pools so that I've been able to achieve my swimming goals. I've won several USA swimming state titles throughout my swimming career, including the 50 and 100 free and placing third overall at the Michigan Open State Meet this past March. This November, I was high school state champion in the 100 freestyle. Furthermore, 
I've broken several records, not only at Dow High and Midland Dolphins, but pool and meet records around the city and Tri-City area. I wouldn't have been able to accomplish everything I have if it was not for the pool space provided by Midland Public Schools. Swimming has provided with many opportunities to compete around Mid Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and North Carolina at states, zones, sectionals, and futures. Through swimming, I've met amazing people, both in Midland and around the state, that I can call friends. I'm proud to represent the Midland community of swimmers. My younger sister Vera swims with me. My little sister Isabel is joining Dolphins this week. We travel to meets together as a family, and it allows us to spend valuable time with each other in our otherwise busy lives. Swimming has helped bring ours and many other families together under a common interest. Additionally, swimming has also allowed me to develop qualities like commitment and discipline, as well as skills like time management and balancing both my academic and athletic lives. Not only that, but the ability to swim itself is a life skill. These qualities and skills are applicable in the real world, and swimming provides a platform for kids to learn these skills that would benefit them wherever they go in life. So going back to my six-year-old self, I'm so thankful that I learned to swim that 50 meter length of the pool. So now, I ask you to please consider both the educational aspect of swimming as well as the opportunities provided by the Midland Dolphins and the sport itself. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Forgive my pronunciation. Arca Nair? I, I'm sorry. Hello, my name is Archie Nair. I'm a seventh grader at Northeast and, an, and a swimmer at Dolphins. As a swimmer with over five years of experience, I can safely say I had fun learning and developing through the years. Dolphins, as well as Northeast, has helped me become a better athlete, show more respect, as well as good sportsmanship, and to become a better team member. Swim team has also helped me make new friends, and both my swim teams have a friendly growth mindset type environment. A swim team helps create bonds and relationships with other, with other people and peers and help connect the schools and communities more. Even at meets, though we do get competitive, we respect and encourage the other team. This advocates more people to join. I love learning under Coach Hall and Coach Merchant. They made me the swimmer I am today. Swim isn't only a sport. It's a way to expand the community and learn new skills. An advantage to this is having a pool in our school. Having a pool in our school can help allow us to have more practices and learn lifeguarding and other survival skills. Swim has helped me become who I am today and I hope to continue to swim and encourage my communities to swim for as long as I can. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Arthur. Randy Hall. Hi Randy, thanks for joining us. Good evening. My name is Randy Hall. Most of my involvement in swimming is related to the administrative side. I serve as a meet manager for Midland High School and Dow High School, Jefferson Middle School and Northeast Middle School, and the Tri-Cities and Saginaw Valley League Championship meets at Saginaw Valley State University. I'm also an administrative official with Michigan Swimming, which has provided me with the opportunity to run the timing systems at college, high school, and community pools throughout the state of Michigan. Dow High School has a Colorado System 7 timing system, which is the most current timing system available. I think that MPS needs to be recognized for making the decision to install the newest system available when it was decided that an upgrade was needed. Most other pools at which I have worked are still using System 6. Other than needing to replace a few touch pads and some minor maintenance issues in regards to the timing system, MPS is up to date. However, the scoreboard is behind the curve. While the scoreboard works fine at Dow High School, it only provides basic information. All the other pools at which I have worked have newer, updated scoreboards. Some are even two generations ahead of Dow High School, having replaced their upgraded scoreboard with an even more up-to-date scoreboard. The other high schools in the Tri-Cities with similar pools have all upgraded to newer scoreboards. The current scoreboard is like an old cathode ray TV. You can watch it, but it does not provide all the information you can get from a flat screen TV. This is the biggest need I see for the Dow High Pool from a technical standpoint. Another point I would like to make is in regards to the partnerships between public schools and the, their communities. 
I have worked at many pools where successful partnerships exist between the school system, swim clubs, and the community at large. The high school swim teams and local swim clubs work together in the shared usage and in some cases costs of their respective aquatic centers. While MPS is very accommodating in allowing the Midland Dolphins to use the Dow High School pool, I believe that having a closer partnership can only benefit our students and swimmers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Newman. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Um, Hello and thank you for the opportunity to demonstrate our passion for swimming in Midland. My name is Jeff Newman, a local ER physician and proud parent of two Midland Dolphin and Dow High swimmers. My wife Karen and I understand the benefits and lessons learned through sports and we introduced our children to soccer, like everybody else in Midland, basketball and even dance. However, they really didn't enjoy these and believe they were not the sports type kids. Then we met Coach Buffy Hall. <laughs> Almost makes you want to cry. Um, and it changed our family's lives forever. Ben and Claire were 11 and 9 when they began swimming with the Midland Dolphins. They immediately made new friends and committed themselves to becoming competitive swimmers. Through excellent Dolphin and Dow coaching, Ben learned how to do all four strokes at age 11 and at age 17 capped his Dow career with a second place finish at the state championships in the 400 free relay, breaking the school record and becoming a NISCA high school All-American. He never thought he would even be an athlete. Our daughter Claire also excelled in the pool and her success swimming with the Dolphins and Chargers led to multiple college scholarship offers from schools like Northwestern, Rice, Ohio State, and the University of Michigan. There were many, many more. She's now a junior swimming for the University of Michigan and has several teammates from Dow swimming in college. This would not have been possible without Midland community support and our dedicated and talented coaches and staff. Unfortunately, our pools in Midland are aging and unable to meet the needs of a robust and competitive swim program and cannot provide a venue for community recreation and exercise programs. We have visited almost every community and high school pool in the state over the last eight or nine years and are frequently in awe at the beautiful natatoriums. Midland has a lot to, of work to do to catch up. We have so many first class amenities in Midland, the Center for the Arts, the Loon Stadium, top tier schools and even a beautiful curling facility. We desperately need a state of the art community pool that will one, support the training and competitive needs of our amazing swimmers and two, provide a venue for public recreation, exercise, and programs benefiting the elderly and the handicapped. Also, being able to host large swim meets will generate significant benefits for the town of Midland as traveling swim families and spectators stay, eat, and explore Midland. Quickly, Ben, my son, wanted me to pass off, says, swimming has taught me the importance of setting a routine. As I get faster throughout my year swimming, I was able to see the payoff of my commitment on a daily basis and the planning required. I have been able to put this discipline into practice as a student at U of M in my future career. Thank you. Sorry for being a little verbose. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Anna McGee. Hi, Anna. Thanks for joining us. Hello, my name is Anna McGee, and I am a coach for Midland Dolphins and Midland High School Girls Swim Team. I grew up in Midland and began swimming for Midland Dolphins in elementary school. I continued to swim for Northeast Middle School and Midland High School. I found myself back in the area in 2020, where I began my coaching career with Midland Dolphins, and in 2022, began coaching the Midland High Girls Swim and Dive Team. This was a full circle moment for me. I am now able to mentor and share my knowledge and passion of the sport in the same area that helped me grow as a student, athlete, and person. I am thankful for MPS for the opportunities being a coach has given me. 
and I am thankful for the 80 high school girls in the pool between Dow and Midland High and for the relationships between coaches who work together to benefit both schools. I hope to continue to watch our programs grow and succeed while providing our athletes the opportunities and resources they need. I look forward to the years to come as I continue to be a part of this community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Eli Soderberg. Hi, Eli. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. And again, my name is Elijah Soderberg, and I'm currently a, a sophomore at Dow High. The Midland Dolphins are much more than just a swim team. It brings together a swim community and has proven to be a building block to success at not only Dow, Midland, but also the tri-state or Tri-City area. When you walk into the pool at Dow High, every, everyone is drawn to those records that have been there for countless years. And all of those swimmers originated from the Midland Dolphins. And our coaching staff is amazing. They have worked many areas and on the Midland Dolphins and with Midland High. <laughs> many of our coaches have at one point been a swimmer, either Midland Dolphins or wherever they lived. And they taught us through their time as a swimmer how to be dedicated and have great time management skills. On a personal level, I've been able to have great success through Dow High and through the Midland Dolphins. This past season, me and my teammates at Dow High were ranked number one in the state for about two months in the 200 freestyle relay. When we got to the, that state championships, we finished third overall. and I couldn't tell you how proud we were to have that third place overall finish. And through the Dolphins, I've been able to go to on national level. I've competed in places like Florida Gulf Coast in Florida, uh, Eastern Michigan University, and uh, IUPUI in Indianapolis. While I'm at those meets, you see amazing swimmers, and they have the amazing teammates behind them. Midland Dolphins is the same way. That entire group of kids you have is a family, and that family you'll carry on for many years. Um, in conclusion, my family is a swim family. I'm the oldest of nine siblings, and eight of them of whom will be swimming at various levels of the Midland Dolphins here in the near future. Not all of my siblings are as at the competitive level as I am, but they all know the basic safety around the pool. Our swim program programs are necessary and crucial in making sure that all individuals build those life-saving life -saving skills in and around the water. It is, an it is important that we band together to protect and ensure that the future of the Midland swimming community continues for all future generations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Emma Sower, Sour, sorry, Sour. Hi, Emma. Hi. Thanks for joining us. As you said before, my name is Emmy Sour, and I am a 16-year-old junior at Dow High School. I have been swimming since I was six years old. I have been able to keep it, compete at the national level and been able to break many records with my teammates and at Dow High School and at Midland Dolphins. I have been afforded the opportunity to travel to multiple states in order to compete with hundreds of athletes and swim in hundreds of pools, everything from chlorine and bromine to regular salt water. With all that, with all that experience, I can say with certainty that swimming in a well-kept pool makes a difference, like makes a world of a difference. Moving to Michigan when I was 10 years old, I joined the Midland Dolphins and me immediately felt the love and the compassion from the family I n now call my family. And but I, however, also felt the immediate difference in the facilities and equipment quality. Coming from Kentucky and swimming with the Cardinal Aquatics for four years, the standard was very obviously not the same. The Cardinal Aquatics are held in uh, Louisville, Kentucky and hold their practices at the Ralph Wright Natatorium. This is the same pool used by the collegiate athletes and for practices and meets. Going from being a part of a team with 300 plus swimmers in a big city to a team in a small town that has access to maybe one really good pool was a massive shift for me. However, the coaching staff was unlike any other I'd seen. They were our role models and trade us into the swimmers we are today. 
Swimming to me, as with many other athletes, is a form of escape from the world and our, our teenage problems. Swimming is extremely exhausting and releases endorphins, which help improve your mood. Endorphins allow swimmers to hold their breath for longer, find new gears, and they help reduce immediate feelings of pain. Swimming has become a therapy for me because of the routine I set for myself, and it helps me have a sense of control in my life and help me stay focused on my goals, like sc in school or in regular day life. Swim swimming is a very individual sport, unlike most other sports, whereas if you make a mistake, your team can help cover it up. You rely on a lot on yourself, and it can be very mentally challenging staring at a black line for about two hours a day. And having a nice facility to stare at that black line is very important to me in swimmers in Midland and in Michigan and all over the world. No swimmer wants to get in a pool that looks lime green or is 101 degrees. And no swimmer's parents or spectators wants to sit in stands that look like they can give you a splinter or sweat more than the athletes themselves. As for USA Swimming, I, in my experience, I swam for the team I swam for um, before in Michigan or in Kentucky was a huge team. I had the opportunity to swim under Olympic swimmer Kelsey Dahlia, who swam at the Rio 2016 Olympics for the USA. I have been to the nicest facilities and some of the worst. I also had the opportunity to swim at IUPUI this past spring, and that pool is where some of the Olympic champions have trained. Even some of the fa small facilities I have swam at have had an amazing quality of equipment. They make sure that their swimmers are best equipped to represent them as a city, team, or school. I hope Midland Public Schools can see how important swim is just, is to this community and see how important this family of swimmers is to everyone in Midland. Thanks for having me. Hello, my name is Jensen Bellingham and I've been swimming for the Midland Dolphins for four and a half years. When I first joined the Dolphins, I was nervous because I didn't know anybody, but they welcomed me like a family. The Dolphins and myself are very thankful for all of the support and funding that the community has given us to continue this wonderful program. Ever since I was about three to four years old, I started swimming for my home team in Batesville, Indiana. I grew up in a pool and couldn't imagine my life without it. The water is like a second home to me. I couldn't imagine life without a pool and I bet my fellow swimmers could agree with this. My swim team has some of the best people and coaches I have ever met. I came here expecting friends for a while, but not the lifelong friends like the ones I got. I am also a CSO, and I recently went to Hemlock Semiconductor and met a few people that recognized the Dolphins and asked me about it. I currently go to Nouvelle, a school in Saginaw, but next year I plan on going to Dow to continue swimming. Your partnership with our swim team has helped us achieve amazing goals and brought us to our full potential. With your support, we have made it to regionals, megs, and even sectionals. When we, whenever we go to these big meets, or any meets in general, we wear our Midland Dolphin shirts with pride and dignity. I have recently made this states in four relays with my friends Ransom, Owen, and Gabe. We did four relays. With your support, we could achieve so much more for our team and community. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Trenton Smurden. I've been uh, a Midland High swim captain and been swimming on the Dolphins for five years. I have really enjoyed my time with the Dolphins. I joined the Dolphins the summer after my seventh grade year. I had swam for the Northeast team for two years and wanted to improve before my eighth grade swim season. The coaches on Dolphins saw my ambition that summer and urged me to move up a group to challenge me. <clears throat> Coming back into my eighth grade year, I was the best swimmer on the team and was on the way to break some school records before COVID hit. I continued with Dolphins through COVID into my high school years. My sophomore year, I swam in the 200 freestyle relay and the 200 medley relay, breaking both school records and making it to states for the first time in the past 20 years at Midland High. My success in either program wouldn't have been possible without participating in the other, and both only, only with the combination of the school and Dolphins, I was able to succeed. I am looking forward to leading a new generation of passionate swimmers at Midland High, and thank you. Hello, I am Ransom Kurzer, a AAA level swimmer and ninth grader at Dow High. 
Swimming to me started as something to keep me healthy and out of the house when I was younger. It quickly developed into a challenge, a drive, and a passion. It helped me create lifelong relationships with my teammates, coaches, and mentors, many of which are speaking here tonight. Swimming has become such a large part of my life that it has brought me from Bay City to Midland Public Schools to the Superior Swim Program and facilities, which I am incredibly appreciative and grateful for. I know of at least two others in the next year that will also be driving out of district six or more days a week just to be part of the Midland Swim Program. Swimming is important because it brings people together. It reinforces all of the aspects of a good community as it allows people to learn to be better in all kinds of different ways. As students, people, and obviously athletes, access to swimming is vital to continue to help the next generation to develop into healthy, active, and high-functioning young adults. Whether students swim at the high school, sectional, or national level, the principles of discipline and determination passed from swim to students are beneficial for all members in the community. It brings in students and it creates jobs. It shows us how to work hard, how to solve problems, and how to stay determined, even when it gets hard. Whether it's the passions developed, the friends made, the lessons learned, or the values passed down, it all comes back to our access to facilities and training centers. Swimming is such a big part of our lives, and sharing our passion has become a passion itself. The pool is so much more than water to us. It's our sanctuary, our home. It's our therapy and our health. It's a place we all go to become better people. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Kinsey Wolf and I'm a 7th grader at Jefferson Middle School. I'm a swimmer for the Midland Dolphins and I have went through the Greater Midland Community Center Swim Lessons program starting at 6 months old. I joined the swim team when I was 5 and at age 7 I started swimming in USA meets. A USA meet is when a meet is sanctioned by the USA Swimming Governing Body. Basically people all across the country get to compete against each other. In 2020 I made it to my first Michigan State meet. To qualify at this level, you have to swim an event in a certain time standard. I qualified on two relays with three other girls. My goal each year is to qualify for this meet. With that being said, swimming is my life. It's a lifestyle for me. Everything I do has my goals in mind. Without swimming, I wouldn't be complete. I have learned so many life lessons through swimming. This sport teaches discipline. You aren't going to be the best by talent alone. You have to sleep right, eat right, train right, and do extra things outside the pool. During COVID, I learned a very important lesson. While away from the pool, I started lifting, eating healthier, and sleeping better. When I got back to the pool, I realized how much these three things add up. This sport also teaches that hard work pays off. The moment when you touch the wall to see a goal accomplished, a meet qualified for, or even a personal best in an event is a moment that you will never forget. You learn from a young age that you have to work hard. I will never forget March 4th this year. That day, I qualified at regionals in two events for states while being the new 13-year-old. It was at that meet I realized that hard work pays off. This thought leads to another point, patience. You might want the hard work to pay off right away, but you have to have patience, continue to believe in yourself, and work hard because it will pay off eventually. Since swim takes a lot of dedication, I have learned that I can't do everything I want to do. It teaches me to prioritize certain things over others. In fact, I'm so used to saying no that I think my catchphrase is, sorry, I have practice. This can actually be very useful when I'm an adult because work situations will come up and it's better for my well-being to say no to other things that aren't as important than to try and cram everything in. In total, swimming is my life and has taught me lots of lessons. I believe every child should be able to experience everything I have been able to. Thank you for providing the Dow Pool and the Community Center Lap Pool. Without those two pools, there wouldn't have even been a team. Please continue to invest in our facilities so our program can continue in the future. Thank you for your time. Hi. My name is Luke Jemmerich. I'm a 24 
and I've been swimming since 2006. I started swimming with the dolphins when I was eight years old. Coach Hall has been coaching me ever since. She is awesome. She even created a senior group in dolphins so that all swimmers could continue to swim. In Midland, Michigan, it is hard to find pool times unless you are part of a swim team. So I swam on five different teams, including Midland Dolphins, Special Olympics, Delhi, USA, and Masters. Each team provided me with opportunities to improve and complete being a part of high level teams challenged me to train hard in the gym, learn the right stroke mechanics, and become a more independent person. In 2018, Coach Hall and all of my other coaches helped me swim fast enough to qualify for the USA Down Syndrome Swimming National Team. The team travels all over the world to compete against other countries in the world. So far I competed at the Down Syndrome World Championship in Canada, Italy, and Portugal. Last year, Team USA took fourth place in the world. I qualified for six events, and I was selected for five relays. My best personal finish was 14th in the world. I was so proud. <laughs> I was so proud to be part of Millie, Michigan to represent the USA. After the championship, I had open heart surgery. So I had to recover and get back into shape. I missed being in the pool, missed being with the dolphins, masters, special Olympic swim teams. I don't have many times to be able to swim. Sometimes it works for me to swim at the community center. Sometimes I swim at Saginaw Valley State University. I miss being in the pool with my teammates. I'm so motivated, just trying to help me I might have a sense of humor. <laughs> if I stay in the pool, I'll be able to see my teammates. All local meets at the USA National Training Camp. I'd like to thank all of my swim coaches and friends for having high hopes for me. They are the greatest fans ever. They motivated me to keep working hard in the gym, in the water, being included on the teams has me all over the world and has taught me to believe in myself. Thank you for supporting swimming in the Berlin community. Thank you, Luke. Tough one to follow, Jessica Day. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, yeah, like I'm saying, my name's Jessica Day, and I I have been um, dislocating my knee since I've been to walk, and I have had um, physical therapy, I wore my brace, and I walk in with a walker. <laughs> um, I've been having a knee surgery. Finally, I found a doctor at Cleveland Clinic and who able to add a new tissue in my knee to help hold in place. And my place of success of confidence in, in the pool, I have been including dolphin swimmer for seven years now, 
and I have a Special Olympics rewards. I won that, by the way. <laughs> and I'm ready to swim in 2023. And last year, I, in the USA National um, Camp for Down Syndrome, and swimmers in Florida, swim have been life changing for me, but it is a bit big bit health benefits and giving me the opportunity to include my community. I am thankful for using the pools at the Maryland Public Schools in a great a Maryland Community Center for my both Dolphins and Special Olympics. Please, I want to take a look at the Dolphins program. Does, and can you for MPS, each helping others, assisting each other makes Maryland a community for and a choice to, for people to live and to grow together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Brian Sower. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, my name is Brian Sauer, and I would like to make some comments regarding the swim facilities in the Midland community. I'm a parent of two daughters, who are varsity swimmers for Dow and USA Swimmers for the Dolphin Swim Club as well. My youngest daughter spoke uh, earlier this evening. I'm the head timer for the Dow um, Girls Varsity team and frequently involved in various volunteer activities with the Midland Dolphins. I would like to speak today regarding the Midland um, Dow High School uh, sp pool specifically. Over the years, the MPS uh, teams and the Dow team uh, which uses pool have achieved a great deal of success with the members of those teams competing at state and higher levels and many going on to compete in college. During past visits from college coaches they have commented that they are surprised how good our swimmers are given the limited facilities that they train in. Uh, I believe the success is a testament to the coaching staff at MPS and the Dolphins. One can only imagine how much uh, more successful these teams and these swim programs can be with some improvements to the facilities. There are two immediate areas in which I believe would help greatly with the Dow pool. The first would be new starting blocks with, uh, with wedges. These are standard in most facilities uh, where our swimmers compete. Lacking them in our facility uh, presents a disadvantage to the swimmers for both training and competition. And the second is a new scoreboard, uh, which is a standard where most of our swimmers compete as well, and Randy Hall had mentioned previously. The current one is limited, uh, has very limited functionality and has not been reliable. Uh, Randy used a good example, I'll use another, uh, and that would be the, an old school flip phone where uh, you, uh, compared to a modern smartphone today. The flip phone provides very limited basic functionality, while the smartphone can do all that plus many, many other needed and beneficial features. What is needed is a modern scoreboard with full video capability this would help the swimmers, the divers, and spectators at the meet and provide coaches and athletes improved instructional capabilities at practices. The larger full function video display could also be beneficial for large assemblies at the school and provide a variety of video content, even things that are unrelated to swimming. These improvements would require some investment, no doubt, but would be an outstanding enhancement to the facilities and greatly elevate the swim programs for the Midland Public Schools and the entire community. In this effort to improve the swim programs, I would ask continued partnership with Middle, Midland Public Schools to make our uh, pools a priority for future facility planning. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <laughs> Carl Reich. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I have made a mistake. I have a swimmer that I was supposed to sign up that I believe I skipped. I am happy to have him take my time because it was my he'll mistake. Have, he'll have plenty of time when you're done. Well, I'll have him talk. 
Sure. Just to make sure you go. Ben. Good evening. My name is Benjamin Strachey. I'm sixth grade at Jefferson Middle School. I come here tonight to tell you how much swim team means to me and how proud I am to be a swimmer. My family moved here from College Bill, Pennsylvania when I was seven years old and starting first grade. Throughout the years, I've tried nearly every sport that Midland has to offer, including skateboarding, where I promptly broke my arm. I decided to join the swim team so I could rehab my arm before baseball started. By the time the baseball season came around, I was hooked on swimming, earning the nickname Swim Team by my baseball coach. This is likely due to the fact that I showed up late and with wet hair to every single baseball practice. It is in the pool that I feel the most at home. I found my community, my friends, my family, and my passion. At Jefferson, all 40 of, at Jefferson Swim, all, all 40 of us pile into cars and head to the community center every afternoon. Swimming 10 to a lane is just as difficult as it sounds. I've been kicked in the face while swimming freestyle. I have a scar on my leg from a collision during a flip turn. Practicing butterfly is not something you can really do with that many bodies in the water. I was really looking forward to the new pool at the community center until I learned that they wouldn't be adding any more lanes and they were taking away the blocks that we needed to practice our starts. These are both obstacles that will make it harder for the Jefferson swim team to be competitive against our peers. It will also be difficult for us to introduce new Jefferson students to this team. Many of my teammates use the community pool during their weekends to practice flip turns and starts, things that are difficult to practice with that many kids in each lane. As a Husky, I have known the friendship and pride of being part of a team. As a member of the Dolphin State team, I've been able to swim in some of the best facilities in the state of Michigan and learned what it means to work hard towards my goals. I want to thank Coach Hall and Midland Public Schools for providing me the opportunity to grow in my sport throughout the years, throughout my years in school. I hope to one day earn a scholarship for swim. I look forward to my community working together to find a solution to our pool problem that will allow us to be the best swimmers we can be. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carl Reich and I serve as a president of the Midland Dolphins Board. Thank you so very much for allowing all the swimmers to speak tonight. There is very little I can add that you haven't already heard. What I can say is our message today was to be very appreciative of the support that MPS has given to all of our swim programs. Our second piece is to bring awareness of the facilities challenges that we have coming in the future. I don't know where my third grader will practice when he gets to middle school because that is where our pool situation is in the community. We will not have blocks or lanes for him in the future. I can't even imagine what will happen when my kindergartner is trying to have swim practice in middle school. Our aim is to simply bring awareness that in the future we have a facilities problem in the community. I know that we have the resources and the mindset to solve our facility problem together. It is very clear we are disconnected as a community. During my short time, I have heard the phrase, that's not our problem. And yes, we're aware, but I'm not sure we can understand how to solve it. Our simple ask is this, I will stay till the end of the meeting. I would love for a member to volunteer to serve on a citywide committee to look at aquatic facilities. It is not one person or one group's duty to solve this problem. It's everybody's. So I'd love if someone would come with me in a citywide committee to look at our facility problem. Thank you. Thank you. That is the end of the list of speakers wishing to address the board, but I know many of you came in after the list was brought to me, so I'll ask now, is there anybody else wishing to address the board tonight, please raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Allison Wilcox, and I'm here tonight to talk about the district's support for diversity, equity, and inclusion, both in programs and opportunities for our students to learn and in the board's criteria for selecting a new board member to fill any openings that may come up should member resign. As I came into this building, I saw the vision statement passed by resolution voted on by this body. Lead with respect, trust and courage, 
ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, enable all to exceed to achieve success. By passing this resolution, this body has already stated and made a commitment to DEI. In other words, if there is any, oh, excuse me, um, if there is any question about this community's support for inclusivity, equity, and inclusion, I'd like to remind you of the voting results in the November 2022 MPS school board election. The three candidates who received the most votes were those candidates who supported the DEI um, efforts of Midland Public Schools. Not only did they receive more votes than the other candidates, but they received a, much, a large margin of votes separating them from the other ca candidates. Significant enough to say, to send a clear message, this community wants the board and the Mudland Public School Administration to continue supporting DEI initiatives. So I ask you to lead with, tr with courage and trust that your community will respect you for continuing to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, both in the programs we provide for our students and in any new board members which may join this body. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Olivia and I am a junior at Dow. I recently moved to Midland July of 2021 and in my short time here, I have laid awake multiple nights wondering how the existence of DEI issues is denied when I, a 16 year old, have to stand in front of my school board begging something to be done about the casual racism my family and myself endure at the hands of students and administrators. I come here not as a teenager trying to defy stereotypes or insert myself into adult issues, just to express the genuine concern for my family's safety that I hold. It should not take the involvement of a child, and it's rare that I admit that I am a child, I'm going to be honest with you, to recognize the futile nature of preaching DEI-based achievements while simultaneously ignoring and minimizing the experience of marginalized groups endure. Though I do not have the answers or some perfectly thought out solution for this problem, I know that the first step would be listening to the groups and valuing the opinions that are constantly being boasted through our DEI statistics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. My name is Jan Lanter. You need to, do I need to say anything else? You, you, can, you can bend the mic down. I'd rather be taller. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I did come to talk about swimming, but I want to endorse all those swimmers because I did my swimming today and I'm 70 years old. And if I had had swimming when I was in that little town in Southern Illinois of 5,000, I would have been a happy, I'd be a better swimmer today. I actually came up to say something about um, a question that was once asked in a group about um, how do people, how are people that are chosen for the school board when somebody steps down in the middle of a, of an, of a um, term? And the answer given by someone on the school board was, we picked the best one. And that puzzled me because I, I figured there must be something else to it. And it, you know, maybe you did pick the best one. I'm not saying you didn't. I'm just wondering if there's a criteria somewhere or where I can find out that information. So I thought I'd come up and cheer on the swimmers and ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Seeing nobody else, we'll close public comment. Um, I think unless everybody's planning on sticking around for the rest of the meeting, uh, we'll take a couple minute break. We'll take a three, four minute break and uh, let you guys clear out if you want to leave. If you want to stay, you are of course welcome to.
Moving on with item seven on our agenda tonight, we have uh, four actions, social media litigation. Uh, Mike. So this is much like the, uh, the litigation we were just involved in um, with the Jewel uh, case. So this is again a litigation brought forward against Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, so many other social media platforms. It's a national live suit again of, of, of school districts donating. Um, the expectation is that social media companies target minors to maximize the profits despite the knowledge of the severe detrimental effects of the excess of social media. As a minor's research confirmed the social media is associated with increased rates of depression, anxiety, eating disorder, suicide, and property damage. And property damage we certainly experienced. Uh, we had most of our silk dispensers uh, during uh, events all came off the walls. And so we have a few months of damage to our uh, people who kept trying to lost it. No risk to us again, just like the other one. So I can't see what we would. Okay, thanks, Mike. I will uh, accept the motion for MPS to join the social media litigation as described by Mr. Sherrill. So moved. In support. Motion by Mr. Hetfield, support by Mr. Rausch. Any additional discussion? It just requires us to sign on, right? That's the. Yes. Like yeah. a form, right, that we have to... Yeah, have so with your that. approval tonight, this amendment adjoins the paperwork that we turn into. Um, Truen is acting on behalf of the Michigan School Districts, but it is the same firm um, out of California that brought the other litigation forward. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next up, we have uh, curriculum instruction and assessment, beginning with item 8.1. This will be our um, CIA study committee minutes for March 20th, 2023, read by Lynn. Yep. We met here at the administration building at 1.30 p.m. And the first topic, staff and curriculum development proposals. Members of the CIA team presented 23 proposals that represent the key areas of need for curriculum development and professional learning for the 23-24 school year. The proposals will be presented for information to the Board of Education at the April meeting, followed by action at the May meeting. Implement implementation will be based on available funding and begin after July 1st, 2023. Next, diversity, equity, and inclusion update. On March 21st, leaders from the Eastern Michigan University College of Education, along with representative from Alpha Kappa Alpha, will meet with MPS to explore possible recruitment activities. And they adjourned at 2.45. And today we met at the Building Trades House, but a report on that will be forthcoming. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, item 8.2, information only. This is staff and curriculum development proposals. Ms. Miller Nelson. Good evening. I do have for you tonight those 23 proposals that were reviewed uh, at the last uh, CIA committee meeting. These are being presented for your consideration and for the 28 day public review period. And then they'll come back to you for your uh, considered action at the May 15th meeting. These proposals reflect the needs that have been identified for curriculum and staff development. And we're, we continue to work toward alignment to our two uh, continuous improvement goals. Goal one is really around a safe and collaborative culture and learning experience for students. And goal two is around a more curriculum focused goal uh, specific to a comprehensive uh, balanced and ass assessment system. The proposals are, pro proposals are listed for you in the agenda. I'll read the titles of those for you uh, and know that those again were presented in much more detail at the committee level. We have a proposal for blended learning workshops uh, instructional technology workshops. Number three is social emotional learning. Number four is English learner instructional supports. Number five, elementary literacy word study for grades three through five. Play-based learning for our pre-primary center. Number seven is the primary years program collaborative time, uh, which I'll just point out is a bank of hours for our elementary teachers to collaborate after school hours. Number eight is the advanced learning program for students uh, at the elementary level, our ELPS program. Number nine is the science review for grades four through five. 
Uh, number 10 is to support our newly developed Life 102 courses, which are middle school offerings. Number 11, our IB Theater course exploration. Number 12 is uh, to respond to uh, curriculum updates in our CTE courses. So this is a curriculum development proposal. 13 is elementary art and music. Uh, you might know that we are shifting to a 60 minute block for elementary art and music. And this is to support those teachers in recrafting their lessons to correspond to a 60 minute teaching block. Number 14 is elementary world language curriculum development. This is specific to Mandarin in our four world, uh, our four language and culture program. Number 15, world history curriculum review. Uh, number uh, 16 is our sixth grade enrichment program development, which is for our ELP students who will be moving into sixth grade. We have math recovery, which is K-8. I'll just point out to you, this one is uh, specific. We are identifying a small group of teachers who can take a look at this new approach to teaching mathematical thinking, uh, specifically for students who are struggling in math. Number 18 is math curriculum development for grades 6-12. 19 is in response to the new uh, Michigan Merit graduation requirement, the personal finance class. This will allow us to understand how we can either embed that in an existing course or create a new course. Number 20 is uh, science curriculum planning for grades 6 through 12. 21, high school IB diploma program review. 22 is curriculum articulation. We, we are moving toward uh, a place where we can actually document our coherent and aligned curriculum. And finally, number 23 is a bank of resources to more thoughtfully plan a coherent professional learning structure uh, for our teachers. The total for these proposals uh, is $439,919. And again, these are all, of course, once you uh, take action on these, if they are approved, it will be pending the final budget approval uh, later this spring. These uh, proposals, of course, are available for review. If anyone wants to contact me, I'd be happy to sit and talk with them in more detail. Okay. Thank you, Penny. And would you mind just moving right yeah, into Yeah, let's do item that. Three? Uh, again, for your information, textbooks <clears throat> coming to you specific to our math department. Uh, these books will be presented, again, for the 28-day examination period, and they are available in the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Office if anyone wishes to, to come take a closer look. The first book for consideration will be used in our Integrated Math 3 and 4 course, as well as our Algebra 2 and our Algebra 2 Accelerated course. The title is Algebra 2 with CalChat and CalView by Larson and Boswell. This is part of the Big Ideas series, uh, which we're familiar with, and it has a copyright of 2022. The next book, uh, titled Algebra and Trig, will be used in our Algebra and Trig Honors course. This is also uh, Ron Larson as an author, and it's part of the Cengage series, series with the copyright of 2022. And finally, Algebra 1, Grade 8. This book is technically already been approved by the board. This now, though, will be the textbook that we will use for Grade 8 Algebra. So anyone who's enrolled in Algebra will have the same text. Uh, this is, again, part of that Big Ideas Learning series. Okay. These will be back to you uh, for your action in May. Thank you. All right, moving on, we are at item nine, finance facilities and operations. Starting with item 9.1, we have study committee minutes, which will be read by Mr. Blazy. Yes. April 10th, we met at Dow High School in the office conference room and in the pool facility. Mr. Lauterbach, myself, Mr. Hatfield, Charo, Bruton, and Ms. Penny Miller Nelson were all present. Um, we went through our February financials were reviewed. We went through variances that were attributed to the timing of the receipt of winter taxes in 21-22. Purchase card and purchase orders over the bid threshold were reviewed. The annual budget workshop will be facilitated at the April board meeting. Bleacher bid, administration will recommend award of bleacher replacement at several athletic facilities throughout MPS. Seal coating, crack sealing, and painting bid. Administration will recommend award of parking lot seal coating services at several facilities throughout MPS. Food service renewal. Administration will present the fourth renewal of a five-year service agreement at the April Board of Education meeting. Service agreement has been reviewed and approved by the Michigan Department of Education. 
Zero Eyes. Administration will recommend award of a service contract to provide weapons detection on MPS surveillance cameras throughout the district. The award is contingent on the approval of federal grant funding. MFP negotiations, negotiations update. The committee was provided with an update on the status of negotiations with the Paraprofessional Labor Association. Five meetings have been held to date. Bi-weekly sessions are scheduled until an agreement is reached. And then as previously mentioned, we took a tour of the pool facility at Dow High School and the committee will continue talking about that. So we were adjourned at five o'clock. Okay, thanks Brad. Uh, next up, item 9.2. Uh, this is a bleacher replacement bid. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, bids have been accepted and a tabulation is provided in your board packet for bleacher replacement at several athletic facilities throughout MPS. Heirs receiving bleachers include Dow High, Midland High, Jefferson Middle School, and Northeast Middle School. We recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder American Athletics LLC of Muskegon, Michigan for $107,351. If this has your approval this evening, we'll utilize series two bond funds for this purchase. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will accept the motion regarding item 9.2. I move that we approve item 9.2, uh, bleacher replacement bid. Support. Motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Ms. Baker. Any additional discussion on item 9.2? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, item 9.3, zero eyes. Mr. Bruin. Yes, thank you. Um, currently, Associate Superintendent Jaster and Kim Funnel are working on grant writing for this particular item, and so know that this is contingent upon receiving a federal grant for this. So um, if we do receive that federal grant, we recommend entering a five-year service agreement with zero eyes of Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, to provide weapons detection services through MPS surveillance cameras. Um, the price of that five-year service contract is $237,500. All right, thank you. I will accept the motion uh, regarding item 9.3. Make a motion to approve the 9.3 Zero Eyes Weapons Detection Service Contract. Support. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any further discussion regarding 9.3? The um, 200,000 is over five years? That's correct. Okay. 46,500 a year and a one-time $5,000 setup fee. And that uses our existing cameras? That's correct. correct. Okay. I guess I had a question for Dave as to how it gets installed. So we have our own server system for our own cameras. Does this come over top of it and it's software on our servers? Yes. So all, all, the, additional all the video repository stays on our systems but they do view it live okay and that presents the uh, tries to prevent the false positive so there is a team of retired military personnel mostly highly trained seals that start this company and within five seconds they are able to determine if that's a true weapon or not and right now they're i think penny and i heard somewhere in the upper 90 percent accurate so you don't get a false alarm you do not want to necessarily have a false positive right. on this one so right, right. Yeah. what does the like response then look like like how do we get notified if they do see something right right through our phones to okay the, to through the, the raptor system okay. with that. yep good questions any other questions okay all in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next action item is 9.4, gifts totaling $10,000. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. We are seeking your approval to accept a $10,000 donation from the Yider Insurance Group in support of the baseball scoreboard this evening. Okay, I will accept the motion for item 9.4. Make a motion to approve accepting the gift of $10,000 in item 9.4. I'll support. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion regarding 9.4? Is that the total cost or? No. It's not. Okay, it was not. so part of it comes out That's of correct. general fund for? Yes. Okay. Capital improvement funds to be specific. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, motion passes. Thank you very much to the Yider Insurance Group for that support. Uh, next up is information only, 9.5. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. On behalf of administration and the Board of Education, we wish to express our gratitude for 30 gifts totaling $23,553.59 this evening. The gifts support a wide range of athletic programs, field trips, student clubs, and also food service scholarships. And as is tradition, all donors will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits and through written board correspondence. We appreciate everyone's generosity. Okay, thank you, Brian. And thank you to um, the long list of uh, gift givers uh, this month and every other month. Uh, it's every month is humbling to see this list it seems to grow and grow and never end. So uh, we are very, very appreciative of the support that we get. Uh, moving on, we have correspondence to and from the Board of Education. This is item 10, 10.1. Uh, information is letters to the Board of Education uh, from the individual listed there. Item 10.2 is Again, information only letters from the Board of Education to the individuals and entities listed on the agenda. Uh, item, I'm question, sorry. I have a question about 10.1. Yes. What is that in relation to? That was Master a Marco. request for video footage of a basketball, middle school basketball game event. Why was he asking for I believe it had to do with Saginaw uh, Township Schools and um, I really, to be honest, he's an attorney. I don't really don't want to speculate onto that, John, but he has right to FOIA, FOIA any video footage we would have of the gymnasium at the time. Did we have, did we, have a video? we only have what our our um, video surveillance was. There wasn't a game tape of that event or anything, and so we have video uh, tape of that event. He had to FOIA it a couple times because he didn't have the right date and games right. But So you, you see that two behind it? Yeah. That was why. Something happened at that Is that what I'm Correct. We're not sure what happened. Well, we are. We know what occurred, but it, his his grabbing of the footage wasn't for MPS. It was the footage that he wanted for Saginaw Township Schools, and I'm not real comfortable speaking about another school district. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. okay. All right. Um, item 11.1 .1 is a list of the remaining scheduled meetings for the Board of Education through December 18, 2023. Um, again, note that there are two meetings in June, June 5th, June 19th. Uh, both will be uh, budget meetings. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do we but, start early for those or is it just regular, regular 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock, right? yeah. Yeah, you only start this one because you required a holy hearing on the budget. Right. Okay, next up, study and discussion. Are there any points of clarification on anything discussed tonight? The only thing um, in the FFL minutes is a, a recommendation for the seal coding stuff. Is that not coming to us? Or Yeah, we're going well, to bring that to you next better. month. Next month. Okay. Um, there's a bit of discrepancy in bid opening dates, so Great. we're going to wait on that and we'll bring it to you next month. Perfect. Yep. The one we did cancel was fencing. We only had one bid and it was a uh, very poor bid. And so um, we will re-bid out summer for more fall winter work. And we think we'll get more bidders and a better price. Okay. And I think before um, I turn the floor over to Mike, I think Lynn had a couple comments. I do. I do. It's a, kind of a hard one. It's bittersweet, but tonight I, know, I announced that I am stepping down from my role on the Board of Education. When I was elected to a one-year term in 2001, I never dreamed it would be the beginning of 22 years proudly serving the Midland community. Throughout these years, I've had the honor and privilege to serve with three superintendents, many board members, many administrators, each bringing their own unique talents to Midland Public Schools. I have met hundreds of teachers, staff, and students who leave me with many fond memories. <clears throat> These years have seen many challenges, changes, and celebrations, but the students' best interests always came first. As education continues to change in the future, I believe MPS will continue to thrive under this focus and its strong leadership. Although I will not be in an official role in education, I will always be a champion for schools and students. 
my passion, and opportunities that allow them to be the best they can be. I wish M Midland Public Schools all the best in the future. <clears throat> Many thanks to my family and friends who have supported me since the very beginning, and thank you all for allowing me to share in the education of the children of Midland Public Schools, mine and yours, in the past, present, and for the future. I'll miss you all. I wish you all the best. And I have grandchildren, not in this district, but I'm always in, interested in education, and sometimes I tell them more than they need to know or want to know. Scott, on that note, um, thank you, Lynn, for everything. Um, we also have another retirement that will be occurring, and tonight I would like to make a motion to establish a search committee to fill the superintendent position of our retiring superintendent. I'll support, but I don't know that we, I don't know that it's coming. Do we have a date yet? Are we getting to a date, I guess is the better question. Well, when Scott turns over comment, I, I will t announce what I'm doing, but you got a motion yeah, in a second, which Okay. There's a motion on the table. Uh, I just need to tell you that you, you can't you can't do it in the timeline of of me when I'm retiring. So we understand. Yeah. And we have to do a job and establish a committee and look at it through through that. The replacement could be sitting in this room. We don't know that. We have to go through a process. Yeah, but you don't have time to even hire a committee. In, or a search firm in that. So your motion was for a search firm, I think? No, search, no, no, committee. search committee. Search committee. Search committee for the board. Because you won't have time to bring a source then. Okay, so motion by Mr. Blaze is support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion? I will just say I, I don't know that a search committee of board members is the right avenue to uh, obtain a new superintendent when and if that time happens um, it is done by a search firm which I think we would eventually hire to do we would have to we, we use a search firm when we hired Mr. Sherrill so traditionally when you do an interim you ask the board president to bring back a candidate that you all vote on and then you go out for a search firm and interview multiple search firms and you conclude on a search firm, then you start pro about a six, six to eight month process to do a proper search. And, and the process, which I'll talk about a little bit, occurred exactly that way 10 years ago. It did. Okay. All in favor, say aye. So, oh, sorry. sorry. Are, we, are we proposing to do something different than what would be standard protocol? for MASB guidelines. What are we proposing to do other than how many members does the committee have? What is the... Well, it takes government? full board approval. So you really ask your board president typically to work with your school attorney on a contract for an interim mm -hmm. and bring back an interim candidate. So... So establishing a search committee would be three people. And if that is then putting together an RFP to go out to the search firms, I'm just doing the first steps of this. That's all. Establishing a search committee. Okay. Okay. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I will oppose it. I think it's premature at this point, but. Okay. One, two, three, four. Okay. Motion carries. I guess we have to figure out what the search committee looks like and what its purpose Typ is going to be. Typically, you point all committees as board president. Less than a quorum, so it's three or less. Okay. I will work on that. Okay, Mike, the floor is yours. 
So about 10 years ago, Scott, Lynn, you guys may recall, and I didn't model any of this off yours, Glenn, but ironically, there's some crossing points. I sat at a table out here, and you two sat at this table, and you were the only two left that are still sitting here at this time. So, And, Scott, you may remember you were a relatively new board trustee at that time, and you asked me a question. Um, the question was, if selected, how long would I be willing to serve? I remember. Yeah, and I actually responded... 10 years and later on when i left the, the committee discussed an open session as they were supposed to and scott made the comment to jerry wasserman that he thought 10 years was kind of short <laughs> and, and scott didn't understand probably at the time that the average life of a superintendency is about three and a half years and, and it's decreasing as you go and so I, and as I was joking with our state superintendent when he was last week, I said, you know, superintendent seekers are like dog years. So like, I have somewhere like 107 after 19 years. So I'm not sure, that, you know, what that means for my future going on. So, but I've certainly done my time. Um, as of June 30th, excuse me. Yeah, as of June 30th, I'll have had the fortune to serve as superintendent in the public schools for the past 10 years. And today I'm giving the Board of Education notice that my last day as superintendent will be July 31st, 2023, when I'm retiring. Scott and Lynn are the only two remaining Board of Education trustees from this board that hired me in 2013. It is my estimation as a superintendent, I've worked with over 40 school board trustees. I've attended approximately 460 Board of Education meetings. And I have fully concluded that is more enough to call it, call it a career. I'm so fortunate to have spent 39 years educating students. My career has spanned two states, five school districts, 10 years as a teacher coach, 10 years as a high school principal, and 19 years as a superintendent. It has been a very busy 10 years in my tenure at NPS filled with so many accomplishments that we can be, not, can be proud of. I couldn't help myself when Brian was presenting the budget tonight. Within that, there's a lot of accomplishments buried in there that maybe only a few of you recall. Some of, the, some of the times there. To name a few, 10 years ago, NPS cash flow was at an all-time low. It was dangerously close to having to borrow funds to pay its bills. Today, our fund balance is over $30 million. I hesitate to say, best I can see, it's the largest fund balance in the state of Michigan at this time. 10 years ago, NPS school facilities were without energy efficiency. School safety and structure did not exist. Classrooms were not up to 21st century learning standards. Little technology existed. Most classrooms didn't even have air conditioning and did not bring in proper levels of fresh air. And the district did not have a strategic plan for the six closed and deteriorated buildings that they owned. Today, our buildings have energy star ratings. AC and fresh air levels meet all standards. Our elementary buildings have new kitchen cafeterias, new gymnasiums, new media centers, new maker spaces. Classrooms have been renovated. One-to-one -one technology has been implemented. A bus fleet has been updated, as well as our operation vehicles. The closed buildings have been raised and repurposed, such as Carpenter Street School. MPS built its first new school building 60 years ago. First school building since 60 years ago when we built the award-winning design Central Park Elementary School. It is believed to be the first STEM school built from the ground up. Aging infrastructure such as water, sewer, lighting, electrical components, drainage, parking lots, curbs, sidewalks have all been improved and upgraded. Over the last 10 years, we've expanded our academic, co- and extracurricular programming to better meet our students' needs and prepare students for the vastly changed society they are living in. Some examples are IVPYP authorized schools, implementation of award-winning project-based STEM curriculum known as Project Lead the Way. Our pre-primary center was open, which has expanded to serve over 160 of our youngest learners. The ELPS program of our gifted elementary students. Our PASS program assists in meeting the needs of non-traditional school learners. Expanded online and blended learning options throughout the district. Our robotics center has expanded over the years to, into its own building and serves every age group in every school. Our nearly 100-year-old Central Auditorium has become a forming arts center with renovations and use of parts of the old Central Middle School. We have created a strategic and organized approach to MTSS and SEL, and we have added staffing and support teachers. We have added literacy, math, and instructional coaches, and much, much more. Ten years ago, our athletic facilities were in dire shape. And today, we have upgraded the community stadium with new turf, seating, press box, scoreboard, sound system, lighting, and a new track. Our gymnasium floors have all been refinished. Our pool has received new seating, filtration, lighting, diving boards. And we have built brand new tennis courts. 
Through our community partnership, a turf field was added to support the local programming. We've added athletic programs, programs as well, such as lacrosse and bowling, which are now MPS high school sponsored team events. 10 years ago, the district and its employees group had gone through some contentious bargaining. Since that time, MPS and its employees have sold every employee contract early through transparent and collaborative bargaining. And because of our careful financial planning, we have been able to agree to highly competitive compensation wages. School safety improvements have been innovative and proactive in order to prevent a safety event. If such an event was to occur, then our response would be as quick and as efficient as possible. Here are a few of the school safety infrastructure items we have added and emergency communication tools, as well as mental health strategies. All school buildings have school safety entrances, improved traffic flow, added emergency communication alert systems, such as radio, Raptor emergency alerts, card access doors, and we have nearly 500 surveillance cameras. Safety filming on doors and windows, classroom door lockdown boots, evolved weapon detection, and much, much more. MPS has also had emergency operation plans, facility mapping for our first responders, expanded our school resource officers, added the ALICE protocol and safety drilling, and the district has added student support specialist assistant staff and student wellness, as well as threat protocols. Technology in our buildings 10 years ago included just a few iPad carts in our elementary schools. Today, we are a one-to-one -one technology district with instructional platforms such as Canvas, our classrooms have sound projection capabilities. Media centers are 21st century standards. Communication, communication systems were non-existent 10 years ago. We have added to Communicate, which serves over 16,000 subscribers. The Our Schools newsletter that is delivered to every subscriber to the Midland Daily News. Our NPS Connects portal receives daily comments and questions for us to respond to. We have a social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We deliver monthly podcasts and host parents through parent information committees. We have purchased electric signage to deliver messages and notifications to our community. Parents can track their students' transportation through live GPS app and so much more. Enrollment was on decline 10 year, years ago. We have stabilized enrollment and beat every enrollment forecast. MPS is the school of choice in the Great Lakes Bay region. Three years ago, we committed ourselves to DEI, and our strategic plan has grown with the DEI director. Equity Audit adopted a, an improvement tool called EJAT to hold us accountable for our goals. MPS is a leader of school district DEI initiatives. Our academic and achievement results remain above state, regional, and comparison school districts. MPS experienced large increases of students from low socioeconomic conditions and increased percentage of students with special needs over the last 10 years, and yet we are a top performing school district in our state. COVID arrived in spring of 2020 and has led to some of the toughest school years in our country and our state's history. MPS provided parents choice with in-school learning and virtual learning options. Masking is a choice as soon as vaccinations were available. Provided in-school instruction at a higher rate than the majority of the school districts in our state. MPS student achievement has maintained above all comparison districts during, during COVID and post-COVID. MPS has created and committed interventions during the school day tutoring and school summary program to assist student learning and achievement. I feel blessed to have served the past 10 years as MPS superintendent. I will end my career knowing I made decisions based on what was best for students. I never shied away from making a difficult decision and always with an eye on student achievement. Not all decisions were popular or worth perfection, but made with students' interest first. As many of you know, I love the message through storytelling and I can only imagine the opportunities for storytelling you have about me when I leave. <laughs> a few final words. All school leaders and maybe Board of Education members need to get themselves a dog, and preferably a Labrador Retriever. No matter what kind of day you have, when you get home, you have at least one full fan of support. Civility and grace. We all need to grant each other both civility and grace. In my opinion, our society has lost this. I have personally experienced this lack of civility and grace. If you want to have good leaders, this must be part of MPS's future. Political grudges and politics do not belong in education. And sadly, we have seen this occur in education and maybe even tonight. Board of Education and Superintendents gets too much credit and too much blame, and sometimes both at the same time. 
keep yourselves from getting too high or too low during those times. Surround yourself with good people, with good values. This is the best formula for success. I've been blessed with so many in my career, too many to name, but you know who you are. A wise man once told me, you meet many acquaintances in your career, but very true friends, and you need to know who would have your back if you found yourself in a bunker in the middle of a battle. There are very few. Don't let the ugly and others destroy the beauty in you. No need to apologize, Penny doesn't like this one, for any error or mistake, let's give each other grace and opportunity to fix it. Many parents had, my parents have had a great influence on me and certainly my work ethic. I grew up in a family business and they insist that we show up every day and get the work done. I think they'd be proud that in the 39 years of my career, I never used a sick day and that wasn't until a few months ago. <laughs> My parents often preach this quote to me, and if you know me, you, you will understand why. Be strong, but not mean. Be kind, but not weak. Be humble, but not shy. Be proud, but not arrogant. Many who know me well are aware of my passions. Baseball, education, all things built in America, the great outdoors, and my dogs, to name a few. But if you really know me, you also know I only have one true love, and that is my lifelong partner that, since childhood that has always made me better. And without her, I would not be here today. Thank you, Pam, for your never-ending support. And I think when said, I would never have gotten this job if it wasn't for my wife. So, Finally, you all know I must slip in a baseball analogy. So thank you for allowing me to serve as NPS superintendent for the past 10 decades, 10 years. <laughs> it feels like it was dog years. Yeah, that was on top of purpose. And as of July, like a great Ernie Harwell home run call, I am long gone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I'm uh, sure we're all going to have some comments for you in the coming months. P uh, please don't. <laughs> Just let me I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's it. I will accept the motion to oh, adjourn. Do we need to talk about the replacement process for Lynn? Uh, I don't. Stepping out, of, uh, stepping out of her position. Do we want to reiterate what the process is for replacing her? Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess if I, you want I to. Can, I can do that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so by law, you have 30 days. Um, yeah. By law, you have 30 days, which if you look at the timing of our board meetings, I think our next board meeting is like about day 27 to 828. We laid it out, Sarah and I did, knowing um, from Lynn that this was going to occur. We'll have a posting on our website tomorrow. It's open for five to seven days because by then um, you need the timing for the board committee to inter to review the applicants, set up interview, re have interviews, and then they bring back the recommendation to the board where you vote at the next board meeting. If you were to miss those 30 days, um, your ESA gets the full responsibility of naming your new board member. So I would prefer that all of you get to have that decision made first. So that's the process. And that was the process that's been followed. Same posting with a few adjustments because of the time when we replaced uh, Pam, I think was the last board member. Yes. Yep. So is that, a, is that another committee? That committee that's got Scott, Scott has to, Scott, yep. Scott, it's got okay. an appointment that he does from there. But there's no motion or anything that has to be no, done. It's just, really it just, no. it just happens. Yep, it just happens. Committee to do okay. so. Three or less is all it takes. And then the committee will present the final candidate to the board for approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? And we have to vote on that at the next meeting. You have to vote. And then that person starts. Correct. Okay. So if we if we kind of have no other, if it's down to one, some, I've seen where there's been two, that's not a good thing. You probably right. need to make the decision to bring one and you have that person ready. Um, they would seat that night. Now, if they didn't, mm -hmm. you would still appoint that night and then uh, they would can just be absent and see that your next meeting. I will take a motion to adjourn. Support, first. so moved. <laughs> Support. Motion by Mr. Roush, support by Ms. Ringgold. 
All in favor, say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody.